Natural Secretary of State for the Home Department and FTH. Uh, good morning. Um, I appear for the applicant, the Secretary of State in this matter. Um, Ms Kilroy QC and Ms Noor appear for the respondent. My Lord, um, this appeal um, arises from uh, what is known as the expedited process, arising from the clearance of the Calais camp in October 2016. And a decision was made, as your Lordships will know, in the claimant's case, or the respondent's case, that he was not entitled to a positive decision under that process in December 2016. Um, now, uh, in Citizens UK and AM, as your Lordships uh, well know, that, that process was held to be unfair at common law, and there is no issue before your Lordships as to unfairness. The tribunal made findings as to common law unfairness, and those, none of those findings are subject to appeal before your Lordships. Uh, the issue uh, here is whether, as a consequence of that finding of common law and fairness, the claimant is also entitled to a declaration under Article 80 CHR to the effect that the Secretary of State is responsible for an ongoing failure to reunite the claimant with his brother for the 17-month period that followed, and whether he is entitled to such a declaration, uh, notwithstanding that there has been, uh, there was no claim uh, for asylum until the very end of that period. My Lords, um, no uh, issue arises before this court as to whether the claimant should in fact now be reunited uh, with his brother. Um, if we all note the relevant chronology is that on the 31st of May of 2018, the claimant eventually did make a claim for asylum. That generated a take charge request by the French authorities on the 1st of June 2018 which request was accepted the same day by the UK authorities. Uh, on the 27th of July 2018, the claimant was transferred to the UK under Dublin 3. And in fact, on the 26th of April of 2019, he was granted a residence permit uh, in the United Kingdom as a refugee. Um, my Lord, there is, uh, as you know, a single uh, ground of permission on which permission has been granted, and that is, in uh, its absolute essence, that the decision of the upper tribunal below was inconsistent uh, with the decision of this court in AM. My Lord, I have five submissions. Perhaps I can outline um, them in, in general terms now before developing them. Um, there are five points. Um, the first point is that the principle which emerges from ZT, Syria and AM is that Article 8 does not give rise to a duty to admit a claimant outside of the formal Dublin 3 process other than in very exceptional circumstances. Uh, no duty to admit arises unless it can be demonstrated that the formal Dublin 3 process uh, is or was incapable of responding adequately to the claimant's needs. And in order to demonstrate such very exceptional circumstances, it will generally be necessary for a claimant to have instituted, initiated, the process of claiming asylum in the relevant member state. And finally, uh, that when considering Article 8, in the context of the expedited process, it is to be recognised that the children were under the jurisdiction of the French care system, who have, who have and had their own responsibilities to affect family reunion under the Dublin regulation and under Article 80 CHR. My second submission is that the facts of this case engaged those principles, in summary, because the claimant did not claim in France at any stage prior to the substantive hearing below. Also that whilst he was a minor, the claimant was, at least for a significant period, under the jurisdiction of the French care system, who bore primary responsibility for the claimant for the purposes of Dublin 3 and Article 8. And that after he turned 18, the claimant, through his solicitors, sought entry to the UK on the explicit basis that it was not necessary for him to claim asylum 
and thereby initiate the Dublin 3 process. My third point is that the Upper Tribunal um, clearly erred in failing to apply the relevant principles. Of course, that failure is quite understandable um, because, of course, the liability judgment was handed down before in advance of uh, this court's decisions in CUK, in CUK and in AM. Um, but it did nonetheless uh, err in its approach. Um, fourth, the upper tribunal erred in concluding that ZT Syria and AM were distinguishable. And finally, fifth and finally, um, had the upper tribunal applied the relevant principles, it would, or should we say, have concluded that the relevant threshold test in ZT and AM uh, was not met. Um, well, before I turn to those submissions and develop them, um, there is a, a preliminary issue in respect of the applications that are before the courts in respect of the bundles. Uh, I know it's not something that Melinda Friend and I want to take too much of the court's uh, time on, but in terms of the bundles that are before your lordships, you should have a slim core bundle, um, a slim supplemental bundle. Um, there's then a bundle of authorities, and there are then um, two what have been called unagreed bundles, which essentially contain much of the material that was below the, um, the tribunal below. Um, now, there's an application by the Secretary of State to rely um, upon a number of the documents, or at least draw the court's attention to a number of the, doc of the documents that were in evidence uh, below. Uh, during the course of my submissions, it's my intention to draw attention to a handful, uh, you'll be pleased there are only a handful, of the documents which are in those two larger bundles. Um, well, I can't see how much, how, why we need to refer to much evidence. It's, the, the point I'm not saying it's an easy point. Is it? no. The point is, is AM distinguishable? Yes, it is. That really is at the core of this. Is it, it is. distinguishable or is it not? Yes. That is really a um, matter of law. Uh, the relevant facts in relation to that at the moment seem to me at any event to be all agreed. Um, so I don't see why we need to be troubled by any evidential matters that are disputed. Well, the, the well, what, what we say is um, that... Um, whether um, there are two questions. One, were the principles in AM and ZT engaged by the evidence that was before the tribunal? And uh, also, if it was engaged on the evidence before it, could the tribunal properly have come to the conclusion that the exceptional threshold test was met? Um, there are, there are, you, will, you will have seen from my skeleton argument that I refer to one or two documents. There is, for example, the claimant's witness statement that was in evidence below that wasn't disputed. Um, there are two or three documents that, in terms of the, when I'm elaborating as to the chronology... And I'm not, I had, is it I, being said that, the, that if you're right about um, the, the, the tribunal having erred in failing to follow or in distinguishing ZT and AM, yeah. that the exceptional circumstances threshold was met in this case? Well, it was below, and that, that was certainly a learned friend's submission below. Um, that they haven't decided it. No, um, but it is a matter on which this court may w wish to take a view. Um, it may wish but to take. Your, a but the sole ground of appeal is whether or not AM and ZT are distinguishable. There's no, se there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no the separate. There's no separate system. ground that if they're if they're if they're not distinguishable, then um, uh, the exceptional circumstances test doesn't apply. That's not. There's no separate ground of appeal for that. No. You carry on, but I think you've got well, 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 be given a steer. Well, well, can, can I deal with it this way? Um, <laughs> okay. I, when, it, when it comes to the chronology, which I say is relevant, um, I, I, I plan to take you, as I say, to a, just a one or two of the documents in the bundle. If, if, you're, if your Lordship or my other friend thinks I'm going too far or it's not inappropriate, you will tell me. But I, I, I have been, uh, there are one or two documents which I say are plainly relevant to the issue of whether the, the test was engaged or not. I, I should say that I, I have not got those bundles in court. That's my fault and we can get them, but I haven't looked at them, and I haven't got them. But if you're going to refer to them... But can I, can I say, why don't we find out from this cruel cruel is it is it part of your case that even if AM and uh, the Syria case are not distinguishable, uh, even if they are not distinguishable, 
that the except that on the facts the exceptional circumstances test is satisfied. Is that is that part of your case? Well, my lord, it's rather difficult for me to answer that question because one of the reasons why we say the test doesn't apply is that it doesn't actually make sense in this context. Oh, okay. And uh, if the test were to apply, it would have to be at least modified in some way to take account of this particular context and the particular unlawful that it, unlawfulness that is alleged. And what we say about that is that there are findings of fact that were made by the tribunal on a whole range of matters, including the applicant's ability to access asylum procedures um, and the effectiveness of those procedures uh, in um, France as a result of the expedited process, which we say are not under appeal and which the Secretary of State cannot go behind not having appealed them. So that we, our objection is set out in, um, at the start of the unagreed bundle in a reply to the, respond, to the appellant's application. Um, and I don't, I don't particularly need to go beyond that, but that is why we have objected. Um, and it's, it's not easy for me to answer the question that your logic put. I apologise. I think, I think, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and, you know, at the moment, uh, that you are confined to your sole ground of appeal. Yes, and I don't seek, I should say, to go beyond, beyond that. Um, as I say, but, but, but perhaps if your Lordship permits me to approach it in this way, I, I, I'll deal with my submissions. I'll take your Lordship to the one or two documents which I say it's relevant for you to look at. And if there's objection taken by my learned friend and the court can see the context in which I refer to it, um, I, 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 I will um, obviously accede to that. Um, can I deal with, first of all, the point of principle um, and the principles that emerge from the case law? And what I intend to do it's just to take your lordships um, through five cases which we say the principles emerge from and draw attention to the passages in particular which we say are relevant to the application um, before you. Um, if you pick up the bundle of authorities and go to tab four, please. Uh, by the way, for what it's worth, uh, you can assume that we certainly all, apart from reading the judgments over there and so on, uh, you can certainly assume that we've all read ZT Syria, uh, Citizens UK, and AM. Yes, very great. I'm not saying should we go to them, no. but just so you know, we have read them quite carefully. Yes, have. Well, I'll, ta I'll, I'll take those perhaps more quickly than I would have done. I'm grateful for that indication, my lord. So the first case is um, CK, which you'll find at tab four. And um, in summary, the facts in this case that there was an Afghan family, husband, wife, and daughter. Um, they arrived in France, were fingerprinted as asylum seekers, um, and um, uh, were removed, um, and, then, and then subsequently arrived in the UK to join family members um, and um, to claim asylum there. So they came from France to the UK. They were then removed back to France, or, or there was a decision to remove them pursuant to the provisions of uh, Dublin III, and the claimant sought to challenge the decision that they should go back to France on the basis that it gave rise to a breach of Article 8. Um, well, in terms of the passages which I wish to draw um, attention to, um, if you um, start at paragraph 9, um, and you'll see that at paragraph 9, uh, the, uh, the court, its Lord Justice Laws, with whom the other members of the court agreed, is that there were uh, rival contentions as to whether Article 8 or the Dublin regulation had primacy. And he says this, these rival contentions, refined and qualified as they were, expose an issue in principle which, as I shall show, is, is a recurrent theme in the cases. ECHR Article 3 aside, what, if any, is the scope for challenge to the removal of the affected individuals to another member state following a decision under Dublin 2 that the other state is responsible for the examination of his asylum claim? The issue is one of principle because its resolution requires the court to find an accommodation between two competing legal imperatives. First, the vindication of Dublin II as a regime for the distribution at an interstate level between the member states of responsibility for the determination of the asylum claims, and two, vindication of individual claims of right which might be denied by a rigorous enforcement of the interstate regime. Ms Rowland states that the first of these predominates, Mr Cayley the second. The learning, unfortunately, swims between the two. And then if you go forward into paragraph 28, please. Um, where Lord Justice Law summarises the cases in this way. The cases on the interstate regime 
are in my judgment perfectly consistent with the enjoyment of a right in the hands of the affected individual to challenge his removal to the responsible state on grounds nothing to do with Dublin II, notably Article 8. And the cases on individual claims show that, the principle, that in principle such a challenge may be brought. And paragraph 31, um, the existence of Dublin II, the Dublin II regime, however, in my judgment, has a profound impact on the application of Article 8 to a case where the claimant is to be removed to another member state following a decision that the other state is responsible for the determination of his asylum claim. McCoskey J described the regulations as a material consideration of undeniable potency in the proportionality balancing exercise in such a situation. He continued, I repeat for convenience, judges will not likely find that a given, in a given context, Article 8 operates in a manner which permits a convention of the Dublin regulation procedures and mechanisms, whether in whole or part. We consider that such cases are likely to be rare. I would express the force of the regulation in stronger terms. Uh, it's a legal instrument of major importance for the distribution of responsibility among mem member states for the administration of asylum claims. If it were seen as establishing little more than a presumption as to which state, which state should deal with which claim, its purpose would be critically undermined. In my judgment, an especially compelling case under Article 8 would have to be demonstrated to deny removal of the affected person following a Dublin um, <coughs> decision. My Lord, the next case is uh, the one that you've been helpful enough to indicate you've read in some detail. It's the case of ZT, uh, which your Lordships will find at uh, tab 5. Um, as your Lordships um, will know, the claimants were three unaccompanied minors and one uh, mentally impaired adult. They were Syrian nationals um, and, in essence, they declined to claim asylum in France and instead uh, wrote to the Secretary of State seeking admission on the basis they had adult, relative adult siblings in the UK. The Secretary of State refused admission and therefore the claimants brought claims in judicial review relying on Article 8. Um, the upper tribunal um, allowed the claims uh, and made mandatory orders requiring the Secretary of State to admit the claimants and the Court of Appeal allowed an appeal against that determination. Well, in terms of the paragraphs which I would um, particularly want to draw um, your Lordship's attention to, um, paragraph three, um, if you just note at the bottom of paragraph three that the, the requests in that case for admission were contained in letters before claim um, dated the 11th and 4th of December, the proceedings were issued on the 15th of December. Um, and then the, uh, the, tr the uh, court described the issue in the following terms. Um, so halfway down power four, in what circumstances can the processes and procedures in, of the Dublin III regulation for determining the member state responsible for processing, a, processing an application for asylum be bypassed because of rights under the European Convention, in particular the right to family life under Article 8, when if, when, if at all, can an individual who's not in the UK decide not to apply for asylum in the first member state he or she enters, and ask another member state directly that it take charge of his asylum application and either directly or through family members require that member state to consider an application to admit um, him or uh, her. Um, my Lords, then you'll see if you turn to Paragraph 64, which is the discussion section, I, I needn't read it out, but if I just draw attention to Paragraph 64 where um, the court refers to some of the ECHR jurisprudence um, and, I, and, and I just note here that some of those cases are the same cases my learned friend relies upon and at the bottom of Paragraph 64 the court observes that those cases do not however involve the relationship between Dublin processes and procedures um, at Article 8 of the European Convention. That relationship does not appear um, to have previously come before the courts in this positive obligations um, uh, scenario. And then again, there's a definition at Paragraph 65 as to the scope of the decision, what is the issue before the court. Um, so although, as the tribunal stated, the Dublin and European Convention regimes may sometimes tug in different directions, it is clear that the Dublin regime does not operate to the exclusion of the human rights regime but exists side by side with it. The issue is the relative weight of the two regimes and the strength of the human rights case needed to override the processes and procedures of the Dublin system. In a case where an individual in one member state, the first member state, uh, the first member state, in what circumstances, if any, will Article 8 of the European Convention, Article 7 of the EU Charter, impose a positive duty on another member state 
the second member state, to admit the individual, here an accompanied minor or in a vulnerable adult, where the individual um, has not used the Dublin processes and procedures in the first member state. So that, that is the issue we say that was being determined um, by uh, the court. If your lordships then um, turn up uh, paragraph 78, please. Um, I, I needn't read it out, given your lordship's indication, but you'll see at paragraph 78 to 80, um, the, uh, their lordships refer to CK Afghanistan, which is the first case I took your lordships to as informing their own um, assessment as to the relevant test. And at paragraphs 81 and 82, the, these are passages I um, would uh, place emphasis upon, there's considerable force in Mr. Eadie's emphasis on the importance of an orderly process, of what I describe as the anterior procedural stage and the need for bio biometric data, verification of identity, assessments of age and the family relationships claim. There is a loose analogy with the triage days of a visit to a hospital's accident and emergency department, although, although there will be some cases where the patient arrives in such a serious state that it's obvious he, uh, he or she must go to the front of the queue, it's not up to a patient or his or her family to decide on the priority to be given to him or her. And then at 82, in this case, moreover, the emergency largely arose because of the appalling conditions in which the, four, the first four claimants found themselves as a result of their decision not to seek assistance from the French authorities. Notwithstanding their difficult histories and trauma, I do not consider that their subjective fear about the French process can, in itself, justify bypassing the Dublin process and the French courts. I consider that Mr Fordham puts the matter too high when he states in paragraph 4.29 of the skeleton argument that human rights law meets children where they are. It does not condemn them for the so-called wisdom of how they got there. In my judgment, what has to be demonstrated by those who seek to bypass the Dublin process and the le legal procedures of the first member state are objective reasons which justify that decision. And that's a passage on which um, we would place a particular uh, emphasis. Um, then we have um, at, um, at paragraph 92, just, I'm going to just draw attention to that. I'm not going to read it out, but again, you'll see... Um, at paragraph 92, the court uh, endorsing the principle that arises from the CK Afghanistan case to which I uh, drew attention. And then at paragraph 95, um, the court said this, I consider that applications such as the ones made by these claimants should only be made in very exceptional circumstances where they can show that the system of the member state that they do not wish to use, in this case the French system, is not capable of responding adequately to their needs. It will, in my judgment, generally be necessary for minors to institute the process in the country in which they are, they are in order to find out and be able to show that the system there is not working in their case. This is subject to the point that, as I have stated, the cases are intensely fact-specific. There will be cases of such urgency of, or of such a compelling nature because of the situation of the unaccompanied minor that it can clearly be shown that the Dublin system in the other country does not work fast enough. The case of the Syrian baby left behind in France when the door of a lorry bound for England closed after his mother got into the lorry referred to in Mr Scott's fourth statement is an example. But save in such cases, I consider that those representing persons in the position of the claimants should first seek recourse from the authorities and the courts of the member states in which the minor is. Only after it is demonstrated that there is no effective way of proceeding in that jurisdiction should they turn to the authorities and the courts in the United Kingdom. Lord, I'm then going to draw uh, attention to the next case in the bundle, which is RSM, so tab six. Um, in outline, it was a case of a, an Eritrean national, an unaccompanied minor who sought asylum in Italy. And his aunt, who was based in the United Kingdom, made an application directly to the Secretary of State in this country to approach the Italian authorities to make a take charge request under Article 17. Um, the Secretary of State failed to respond to that request and there was a JR of the Secretary of State's uh, failure to take action. Uh, the upper tribunal allowed the appeal and made mandatory orders requiring the claimant's admission to the UK and the claimants and the tribunal relied on Article uh, 8. In terms of the passages that I would specifically draw 
uh, your Lordship's attention to. Uh, para 35, please. Um, there's a, uh, a, a brief summary of the uh, principle that's said to emerge from ZT. So para 35, Beats and LJ, with whom Lord Bick and Longwell LJ agreed, gave the main judgment. He held that Dublin 3 did not exclude the operation of the Convention. Dublin 3 and Article 8 operated side by side. This means, as we shall see, that Article 8 of the Convention cannot be invoked to bypass the process laid down in Dublin 3, um, save in limited circumstances, say, such as where there are systemic deficiencies that would lead to a violation of Convention rights. And then if your Lordships turn, please, to paragraph 133. Uh, there's this paragraph. Um, in ZT Syria, as explained above, this court held that a person seeking asylum in another member state of the EU could only rely on Article 8 in English and Welsh courts in very exceptional circumstances. The upper tribunal recognised that the question whether RSM could rely on Article 8 was intensely fact-specific. It held that, a, that as RSM had, unlike some claimants in ZT Syria case, engaged with the Dublin process, um, he had a lower hurdle to cross and that the threshold was overcome, mainly on account of the fact that he was a vulnerable, unaccompanied adult and that there had been considerable delay in dealing um, with this case. And then at paragraph 142, the court deals with that aspect of the tribunal's decision, namely that the claimant uh, had a lower hurdle to cross because he's somebody who did engage with the process. So at 142, it says, in my judgment, Ms. Giovanetti is correct to focus on the Italian processes. And I agree with her that there is no evidence um, that there was unacceptable delay in dealing with RSM's case. Once it was established that he was an unaccompanied child, the process moved forward by stages, which took place in a reasonably timely fashion. The Italian court appointed a guardian who, guardian who was able to keep the Italian solicitors informed. This case did not meet the high hurdle set in ZT, um, and, and there is no basis in that case for holding that the test is less onerous where the asylum seeker engages with the system. So it's, it's the last sentence in 142 that we would emphasise. And then finally on that case, I would just draw attention please to what Lord Justice Singh said, at paragraphs 173 to 175. So turning to issue three, issue three is the Article 8 issue. Um, in we my view, sorry, so para 173, please, my lord, in RSM, right at the, right at the very end. Yeah. So it's the, it's the uh, judgment of Lord Justice Singh. He says, turning to issue three, in my view, the upper tribunal misdirected itself in law when seeking to apply the test which has been laid down by this court um, in ZT, uh, in the judgment of Beats and LJ, which has already been cited in full by Arden LJ, as this court made clear in that passage, recourse to Article 8 in the context of the Dublin system will only be possible in very exceptional circumstances. As Beatson said at the end of Para 95, only after it's demonstrated that there is no effective way of proceeding in that jurisdiction should they turn to the authorities in the course of the UK. <coughs> In my view, the Upper Tribunal in the present case reformulated that question the following way. At the beginning of Para 60 of its judgment, have the claimants demonstrated that RSM's asylum claim is not being efficaciously processed? Um, this is not just a semantic point, although I would note the word efficacious does not mean quite the same as effective. More importantly, the focus of what this court was saying in ZT Syria was on the effectiveness, effectiveness of the legal system of the other member state concerned, whereas what the Upper Tribunal did was to focus on the particular case before it. Yes, I know that it may be said uh, that the, uh, all these cases you're referring us to are really uh, in, in the context of the Dublin system that, that, that what's been telling here in 173, that paragraph in the middle of it, as this court made clear in that passage, recalls to Article 8 in the context of the Dublin system, because what's being said here by the respondent is that this special procedure not in the context of the Dublin system. It, it, it's how it's put, and, and we say that that's not an appropriate analysis because after the expedited process came to an end, the Dublin process was available. The, cla the claimant was under the care of the French authorities and it was available to him at all times to initiate the asylum process um, 
with the assistance of the French care authorities who had the ability to do that. And certainly once um, he had lawyers on board who were advising him um, and he, uh, once he was no longer the age of eight, uh, when he was no longer a minor, a, age 18, um, there's no doubt that um, he could and should have been advised that one of your remedies is to claim asylum under Dublin 3 and initiate the, the process. So we, if that is the analysis, we say of the other side, we would say it's respectfully it's not a, an, a, the correct one. In terms of the analysis, ju ju just on, yes. in the cases up to RSM, yes. uh, before we get on to OEM, um, all of these cases have um, an individual, usually a minor, in France, and um, at least an asserted relative here, a sibling here, yeah. say. Uh, so, so do you say, in, I'm just trying to get the Article 8 analysis, as you see it, correct, formulated in, in, in my own mind. Do you say that Article 8 in those circumstances is engaged? Um, no, we, we, we adopt the reasoning, um, <laughs> I, I, I hesitate, it's your, partly your Lordship's reasoning um, in AM, Lord Justice Singh's language was Article 8 is not applicable. Correct. And we adopt that. So you say Article 8 isn't engaged at all? No. Well, it's not, I, I use the term applicability. Um, uh, the, 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 no, but the, the, the classic way of analysing these things is, is Article 8 one of these other articles? Is it engaged? Has it been infringed? And when you ask, has it been infringed, you take into account a whole lot of circumstances, yes. including any justification there may be under the second yes. paragraph. Yeah. So, I mean, let, let's not start mixing up words. No. I mean, it, I think the classic question is, is it engaged? Was it engaged in the expedited process? Yes. It's so a quite different issue as to whether it was infringed or not. Yeah. But but I don't I don't particularly find it helpful to substitute another word for engaged. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, your lordship, if your lordship analysis that analysis analyzes the matter in that conventional way, I think it's quite difficult for me to argue that it wasn't at least engaged. I accept that. It's very difficult. <laughs> but it's the, engaged, the, but not infringed. But not all. infringed. I mean, the, 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 and that's the reason that I one assumes Lord Justice Singh used the term not applicable. Because in all the circumstances of the case, it wasn't appropriate to say it had been infringed. That's the meaning I would um, respectfully submit must be given to his term not applicable. So ju just, just leaving AM aside for a moment, just looking at the, the cases up to RSM, Article 8 in, in, in that sense was engaged, but you say not infringed. And, and why do you say it was not infringed in these cases? Um, because it was always available to the claimants to, um, to deploy, um, to make use of, of Dublin 2. That was the appropriate forum in which to assert any claim for family reunion. Um, and in the abs that, 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 that it's, the, it's the Dublin regulation itself which gives an appropriate, gives effect to a proportionate uh, balance between the rights of the individual and the broader interests of the community, including those of immigration control, um, because that that because that process is the process which is is, is available, <coughs> it's only in exceptional circumstances that you can deploy Article Eight to get a remedy outside of that. Yes, thank you. What came to have on this? The thing is addressed. I think addressed this in the submissions. I made the wrong ones. In relation to the application of Article. What are the jurisdictional considerations, if any, which arise from the fact that the children are in France? So what we're concerned with here uh, on, an, on an Article 8 challenge is the application of the Human Rights Act in relation to children who are in France. Is, is there a jurisdictional issue or not there? Um, well, well, I think it's a point which was... Um was touched upon by this court in AM, and the court in AM made the point, and it's one of my points, that due regard must be had to the fact that the children under the expedited process were under the jurisdiction of the French care system, who had their own obligations um, to, uh, to affect family reunion, uh, to process any asylum claims that might be made in the context of the Dublin regulation. So 
That's, uh, slightly, that's not really my question. Yeah, that's a slightly yeah, different yeah, That issue I, goes I, to the question of was there an infringement of Article yeah, 8. I, I, Mine's a slightly I, different I, question. It is. And I'm not sure, I think, because <laughs> I would have to go away and reflect on that before I could give you a lot of an answer, but it's not, it's not a point. Um, I know it's not taken, but I mean, it, I, it, I, I find that at least it is a relevant consideration. Potentially. It, it, it may be. I can't. It may be your lordship is right about it, but it's not a point that I've taken in my skeleton argument, or I'm, I'm prepared with an answer to give you your lordship at this particular moment. But we do say um, that it's a the consideration in broader terms that your lordship has alighted upon is relevant to the issue of infringement in the way that was described by this court in AM. Right. I'm then going to take your lordship to. Zeti Syria, where Justice Beeson doesn't seem to have thought that if the, in the case where the exceptional circumstances did apply, and the example of the child yeah. falling out of the back of the lorry, uh, that there wouldn't that there wouldn't be jurisdiction. No, so no jurisdictional issues appears to. It may just be that it's never been argued. No, but um, one can quite see the, that that particular example is an obvious one where. Article 8 is, is, is engaged and potentially would be infringed because Dublin isn't able to provide any, any sort of remedy in that particular case. Yes. In, yeah. in sufficient time. Yes, and maybe your Lordship is, is right about that. And as I, I don't frankly take a point, on, no, take, a, take a point about it. No. Um, and, and, well, I mean, your real point is that where Dublin is, is available, Dublin 2 or Dublin 3 in this case, is available, there isn't an infringement of Article 8. Correct. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, speaking of myself, it doesn't seem to me to be a jurisdictional point, uh, but, but, but in answering that question, uh, uh, as Lord Justice Singh said, that the fact that the children are in France, which is a convention country, uh, is, is a relevant factor well, it, it is. Uh, in, 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 in dealing with that question. The question yeah. of infringement. Yes. Yes, uh, quite it is. It's, uh, well, not, not only relevant, but, but, but we would say very weighty, I mean, perhaps not quite decisive. It's not decisive because, uh, as the cases make clear, there will be exceptional circumstances where that doesn't matter. Right. There's still an obligation for the UK. But, but it is a weighty factor um, in, in the balancing exercise in relation to the question of whether Article 8 is infringed on any view. I mean, if I sort of think about this, uh, just if I can test the argument, I tend to see your point you there. But... I mean, Article 8 doesn't operate, as it were, exclusively um, for one member state rather than another. I mean, you could have a situation where there are several, perhaps, states, member states, each of whom has an Article 8 obligation, depending upon the facts, simultaneously. I mean, it is true to say that uh, in France, where the children, of course, it's, it's a member state, it's subject to the Convention, it's subject to the Charter, it's subject to Dublin 3. That's true. But I don't believe uh, there's a jurisprudential point that just because one country, one member state, is on the same facts, another member state can't be also subject to it. No, and and, and I, I don't put the case in that way. Yeah. The way I put it, um, I hope consistently with the authorities, is that, um, that it's the Dublin regulation which, deter which is the primary uh, means of determining who is responsible at what stage. It's yeah. those processes which are and the hierarchy which is described in the Dublin regulation, which is the primary determinant as to who is responsible for doing what, when. And it's only very exceptionally that one can seek to disrupt, to go behind that system using Article 8. There are circumstances where it can happen. The Syrian baby example is one of them. But it needs something of that order. Or perhaps evidence that there's some grand systemic failing which prevents our, the Dublin regulation operating appropriately or fairly in, in a particular state that is required. Something of that ilk is needed for Article 8 to be... Um, the, the, the baby point is a very good one in a way where you could say that uh, both France and the United Kingdom are under an obligation under Article 8, yes. both of them, to ensure that the baby is reunited with its mother as soon as possible, yes. irrespective of Dublin 3. And, and that case would be, on its face, so obviously very urgent that the, the Secretary of State couldn't, wouldn't lie in the Secretary's, Secretary of State's mouth to say, we'll go and make an asylum claim, go through the Dublin process. That would be um, a wholly inappropriate position for the Secretary of State to adopt in that situation. But that's not to say that it, it won't be an appropriate position to adopt in many other less um, serious situations. Because in the, in, in the, in the same way, yes. um, 
uh, as, as in the baby example, um, where, as in this case, you have a, a, a minor in France and an asserted sibling here, uh, France too is under uh, Article 8 is engaged so far as the French state is concerned as well. Yes. Um, and you, you say, as I understand it, that, that the response to that is Dublin 3. Yes. If you, if you want to take that point in France, then you've got to make an asylum claim and Dublin 3 kicks in and that, as it Absolutely. were, is the Article 8 way to do it. Yeah. And, and what's more, there's a specific mechanism within Article 3, uh, uh, within Dublin 3, to do precisely that. Article 17, as your Lordships will probably recall, specifically refers to compassionate humanitarian circumstances. So if you've got perhaps not a, um, a uh, Syrian baby type case, but something of a lower order on the hierarchy, just a, a strong compassionate reason to reunite a minor or a vulnerable adult, your remedy is to say, well, here's our evidence of compassionate circumstances, France. We're making a claim for asylum. Can you arrange for us to be transferred? That's the appropriate means of achieving that aim. That aim. Um, well, can I just uh, turn, please, to uh, tab seven of the bundle, please? Um, this is the um, decision of the upper um, tribunal in AM. It's not the Court of Appeal decision. And we, just to make it clear, we don't rely, for obvious reasons, on what the upper tribunal um, said in AM. But we, we do say it's quite important to see the reasoning of the upper tribunal and the reasoning that was not approved of by the Court of Appeal. So uh, I'm afraid that th th there are a number of decisions, but if you, the first decision I think is, um, it's a procedural ancillary relief type issue, but if you, which runs to I think 31 pages. So if you just, the first 31 pages, if you just push to one side, you should then get to the substantive decision. Well, the relevant paragraphs to um, look at, um, just the number, pa page five, <coughs> you'll see AM's challenge. <coughs> and page, uh, five? page five, in fact, perhaps go over to page six. Uh, and just to, to go to 31. Uh, no, sorry, page 30, the first 31 pages are, an answer, are, are not the substantive decision. So the first 31 pages behind tab seven, I think, are, are, are a... Um, are, a math, are, are not the substantive decisions. If you, if you push those to one side, you should come then to the substantive determination. Do, do, do your Lordship, your Lordship following my, uh, my direction? Which, which page now? Well, the, 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 behind tab seven, there's a judgment. That's not the correct judgment, because that's a matter, that's an ancillary, and it's an ancillary application. So if you, what I'm saying is if you, the first judgment behind tab seven is not, not the right judgment. If you push the first 31 pages to one side, you will get to the substantive judgment, which starts with a, with a head note at the top of it. Well, I'm now completely confused. Because if I take page 31 of the judgment you've got starting in tab 7, yeah. I get to uh, page, 30. Battle, page 30. Has paragraph 12. Article 8, ECHR, substantive protection. There are, there are two, there's a judgment before that judgment in the tab. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is that, is that so you, you, if you start at the, the, the beginning of the tab and get to page 31, you then start again at page yes. 1. Oh, I've got you. Yeah, okay. yeah I've got that now. Yes. Great. What's the model of yours? Apologise that um, perhaps that yes. by our fault the bundles weren't put together particularly um, well, on, on, at least on this. But your Lordship should now have, I hope, um, the first page of the substantive judgment in, by, in AM. It says at the top, are on the application of AM a child by litigation friend OA, and then there's a head note at the bottom. So if you if you go to um, just to draw attention to paragraph six or page six of that judgment, paragraph twelve, you, you, you'll see that in AM's case, um, like many of the others, there was quite compelling psychiatric evidence in support of the contention that the claimant needed to be transferred, that he was psychiatrically vulnerable. And you'll see that a paragraph 12 is recorded that in respect of AM's case, he was at risk of becoming actively suicidal if prompt, prompt unification did not occur. And uh, I'm not going to go to all of the judgments, but the same is true of all of the other um, claimants. They all had psychiatric evidence um, of a similar nature, 
varying degrees of severity, but all of, all of, all of the claimant's case was that they were very psychiatrically vulnerable and needed to be uh, transferred in order to address that vulnerability. And if you go, please, to paragraph thir page 33, paragraph 58 to 61, yeah. you will see uh, that McCloskey J um, sets out the procedural protections in Article 8, um, referring uh, paragraph 58 to 61 to many of the cases that my learned friend re relies upon and refers to in her submissions. And then um, page 51, please. Paragraph 112, um, the court says this, based our, on our assessment of both the Dublin regulation and the broader rules and principles of EU law above, duly buttressed by the decisions in CK, K and ZT Syria, we conclude that the Dublin regulation and its sister measure applied to the expedited process. So, Lord Justice Higginbottom will no doubt recall that one of the issues which he, he and his colleagues were, refer, were, Lord were required to determine was whether the expedited process itself could be categorised as the Dublin III process. And, it, um, and if you go over to page 52, um, little three, the court said this, AM's subsequent quest for admission to the UK under Article 8 cannot be defeated on the basis that he did not first attempt to secure the same outcome under the formal process of the Dublin regime. It follows the applicant has established the foundations of the grant of a remedy in these proceedings. Sorry, I should have read from 114, the previous page, our conclusion on the correct legal characterization of the Secretary of State's process has the following consequences. So what the court found was that because the expedited process was itself a Dublin III process, um, it followed that the argument couldn't be made that the claimants had not availed themselves of Dublin III. They had by taking part in the expedited process. But, of course, that aspect of the determination was subsequently disapproved of expressly by the Court of Appeal in AM. And then, um, if you, your lordships then turn up para, page 54, Perhaps just to save time, can I just invite you, your lordship, just to read to yourselves the reasoning of McCloskey at paragraphs 122 to 124. You'll just see the essence of his reasoning under Article 8. Mm What, what's a one, two, four, please, my lord? Mm -hmm. um, I'm a, perhaps I, I hope I'm um, not doing uh, an injustice to the eloquent way in, in which Mr. And Mr. Justice McCloskey expresses himself in those paragraphs, but in essence, it amounts to this, that because there were such grave procedural failings, um, that was sufficient to meet the Article 8 threshold, to meet the ZT threshold. And on that basis, you'll see that over the page, page 57, the... Well, at least in, in, in large measure, because he concluded that the expedited process was part of the Dublin process. Quite. That was certainly part of his reasoning, which, which, which conclusion was, was wrong, as the Court of Appeal subsequently held. And then you'll see at page, uh, so paragraph 134, the declaration that was issued by the court in, uh, in AM or the tribunal, and 1342, a declaration that the aforementioned decision and the Secretary of State's continuing refusal to admit AM to the UK are unlawful, being in breach of the Dublin regulation and its sister measure and or the procedural dimension of Article 8 and or the common law requirements of procedural fairness. And the reason I draw attention to, to, to the way in which the declaration is phrased is because that 
uh, declaration is almost identical to the declaration that was made by the tribunal in this case. It's perhaps, perhaps, say for a word or so, it, it, it's very close, and one perhaps can infer that it was perhaps modelled on the declaration made by McCloskey J. Um, can we just see... In, in, in this particular case, in, yes, if you look to turn up the, um, uh, the main core bundle, yeah. and if you um, go please to, um, my bundle's now disintegrated slightly, um, excuse me for the moment. Tab 11 is a review claim team. Yes, okay. just bear with me for a moment please, my lords. It's, yes, but thank you very much. It's behind uh, tab 11. And uh, page 148, so if you go to 149, you'll see that the uh, decision to be judicially reviewed was an ongoing failure of the respondent to make a lawful decision and or admit the claimant to the UK in accordance with his rights under the 3 and or Article 8 and or respondent's policy. If you then turn over to page 151, um, details of remedy, uh, Paragraph 2 of the remedy is a mandatory order requiring the respondent to accept the applicant for transfer to the UK, communicate that decision to the French authorities and or liaise with the French authorities to arrange and facilitate transfer for, forthwith. And then paragraph 4 is a declaration that the respondent has breached Article 8. The other bits I would want to um, draw attention to whilst we're on this document is if you go to paragraph 4.5, um, you, you'll see that, sorry, page 175, para 4.5, that, um, that the, the claimant specifically disputed the argument that they had an alternative remedy in terms of applying for asylum in France. And so, and you'll see in particular at 4.52, they say the applicant, particularly in view of the nature of the procedural unfairness, and how this has affected the applicant, together with his particular vulnerability and the delays thus far, cannot reasonably be expected to start at the process again from scratch. So they specifically disavow that they have that as a uh, remedy. And then at um, paragraph 5.5, page 178, um, what, what it says, in light of the compelling evidence of the applicant's extreme vulnerability and his tragic history, and the nature of the unfairness in the expedited process, there could be no question he qualifies for admission under Article 8, Dublin, Dublin 3, and that Article 8 requires swift admission to the UK. As such, the respondent's failure to transfer the applicants under the expedited process is unlawful under Dublin 2, her policy and or breach of uh, Article 8 ECHR. And Margaret, I should say, whilst we're on this, I, I did state I think in opening that one of that, that certainly the, sec the claimant's position below was that if ZT did apply that there were exceptional circumstances which justified reunion and it, the, the reliance was placed on the factors you'll see at paragraph 5.4 whilst we're on this and the, the claimant's skeleton argument it's alluded to these factors which amount to the fact that he's got uh, relatives abroad and the fact that he was extremely vulnerable you'll see at paragraph 5.46 And well, those are, I think, the, perhaps the most relevant parts, so as far as we're concerned, of the grounds for challenge. That, that comes as no surprise, does it, given the timing of the challenge, which was after AM in the upper tribunal? Um, no, it doesn't come as a surprise. I mean, that, 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 that's right, isn't it? This, this was after the yes. upper tribunal decision. Yeah. Yes, it's so it's so placed upon AM. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so this reflects that is not... No, no, and I'm not, I'm not, no, no, I'm not, not critical of it in, the, no. in, in that no. sense, and it's not surprising for precisely the reason your Lordship um, po points out. It's 5.6 where they say the primary remedy sought is a mandatory order that the respondent agrees the applicant's transfer to the UK. I mean, in short, our point about this is that there can be no question that what the claimants were seeking was admission to the UK in reliance on Article 8, without having to claim asylum. Well, can I then go to um, 
AM in the Court of Appeal, again, I can take it quite shortly because of the indication your lordships have given. Um, but you'll find, sorry, bear me for a moment, it's behind uh, tab nine. So we don't have tabs. Ah. Where the index says we have these, I haven't got tabs, you've just got the page numbers. Ah. Yeah. Tab nine of the authorities. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's AM in the Court of Appeal. Again, I, I'll take it shortly, given your Lordship's indication. Um, so, um, so, para 53, please. Uh, sorry, 52, I should say. Para 52. And this is the recording the Secretary of State's submissions. So, paragraph 52, and I'm looking at subparagraph 5 of para 52. And the submission of the article, the, uh, the, the submission of the Secretary of State recorded at 50, para 52, little 5, Roman numeral. 50, paragraph 53. 53. I'm so sorry, para 53. Yeah. I, I'm grateful. 53, 5, article 8 of the ECHR, through, viewed through the prism of the Court of Appeals decision in ZT Syria, did not require either a different approach to the decision making or for the children's admission to the UK outside of the framework of the expedited process and the Dublin Three regulation. So those, that was the way in which the case was put. And it's, it's, it's um, the, the claim is then, the submission is then outlined in a bit more detail at Para 66, so, which is a submission that was accepted by the court. So ground five relates to Article 8 of the ECHR. It's submitted on behalf of the Secretary of State that Article 8 did not require either a different approach to the expedited process or for the admission of these four children to the UK outside the framework of the expedited process and the Dublin III regulation. The Secretary of State relies in this context on the decision of this court in ZT Syria. The Secretary of State also emphasises that the UT did not appear to give any recognition to the importance of the fact that the children concerned were under the jurisdiction of the French care system. The UT appears to have given no consideration to the fact that, that France bore primary responsibility for the processing of their claims in the context of the application of Dublin III, that France itself was bound to ensure that no breach of Article 8 of the ECHR occurred, and that the children's representatives had not made recourse to the French authorities <coughs> or the courts. And um, then paragraph 87. Um, ground 5 relates to Article 8, I would accept the submissions made by Sir James on behalf of the Secretary of State on this issue. This is essentially for two reasons. First, the upper tribunal reached a view which, in my judgment, is inconsistent with the decision of this court in ZT Syria. It seems to have regarded Article 8 and its procedural requirements as essentially interchangeable with the procedural requirements of Dublin, II, Dublin 3 and or the common law. However, as this court made clear in ZT Syria, Article 8 will only have a role to play in very exceptional circumstances. In particular, it must be shown that the French legal system had systemic deficiencies in it, which rendered it incapable of providing an effective remedy to the respondent children, CZT and RSM. Secondly, I agree with the Secretary of State that the Upper Dream Tribunal gave insufficient recognition to the importance of the fact that the children concerned were under the jurisdiction of the French care system. And then you'll see it, the conclusions, para 93, little 2, um, I would accept the submissions made on behalf of the Secretary of State that two, Article 8 of the ECHR, have no applicability in these cases. I mean, at the, um, paragraph 4.3 on page 4.5.6, I think sets that in context. Yes. And, and that was, I think, um, correctly, uh, sets out the upper tribunal decision, which in relation to Article 8 was that the expedited process was unlawful uh, as being in breach of the procedural protections afforded by Article 8. So, so uh, uh, forgive me, my lord, which paragraph is that? Paragraph 4, subparagraph 3. Yes, that's right. I, I, that, that obviously puts everything put, in context. It puts it in context, it does. I accept that. I agree. Um, and then finally, um, just to take your lordships very briefly to what was said about this issue as far as it matters to CUK. Of course, CUK was, I accept, um, a different type of challenge. Um, I was just taking some notes. This was a uh, challenge to the expedited process as a whole and the legality of that process. The court wasn't concerned with individual claimants, but the two cases were heard together. 
Um, and um, you'll see that at paragraph two, the claim related to the lawfulness of... tab is it? Sorry, yes. forgive me, paragraph eight, tab eight. Um, the, the claim related to the lawfulness, para two, of what has become known as the expedited process, which was established by the respondent in conjunction with the French authorities in October. And then the issues are set out at paragraphs 19 to 22. And the third issue is, was it fair in accordance with the procedural requirements of Article 8 of ECHR? So was the procedure consistent with it? And then you'll see that there's reference at paragraphs 13, 8 to 40, to the cases of both the ZT and to RSM, uh, both of which I've taken your lordships to already. And then paragraph 50, please, of the judgment. Second half of paragraph 50, you'll see, uh, or about two-thirds of the way down paragraph 50, as I have already mentioned, at all material times, it was open to an unaccompanied minor in France to make an application for international protection, which would have then have been dealt with in accordance with the requirements of Dublin III, even the fact that they were not selected for expedited transfer in, in anticipation of formal consideration under Dublin III did not preclude them at any material time from making such an application in the future. And then at uh, paragraphs uh, 96 to 98, well, in, in the paragraphs that follow, I'm not going to, your lordships have read it all, but you, your lordships know, having read the decision, that uh, Lord Justice Singh, with whom the other members of the court agreed, found that there were procedural flaws in the process, in particular uh, the flaw that children weren't given reason, so hadn't, didn't have a target to address any response or concerns to. And um, at paragraphs 96 to 98, you'll see that... Um, they were not persuaded that the existence of the Dublin III process for the purposes of the common law was a sufficient answer to that. So, the, so paragraphs 96 to 98, there are three reasons given why the, that the residual Dublin III process was not an answer, at least the common law. And so first, the reality is the Secretary of State's officials did take into account what had happened in the expedited process later when we're considering the review or filter stage. Secondly, and this is no doubt what uh, lay behind why Siljay felt it necessary to obtain the undertaking which the Secretary of State was willing to give in the High Court, the Secretary took into account what had happened in the expedited process at later stages up to the point at which the undertaking was given. Thirdly, there will at least in principle have been children who gave up and never made a formal application precisely because they'd been given an adverse decision as a result of the expedited process. So for those reasons, the Court was not persuaded that the, the, co that the existence of the overarching Dublin III process was an answer to the common law challenge. But when it comes to Article 8, albeit this issue was not determined by the court, you'll see that it has some observations we do rely on. So para 103, the third issue, Article 8 of ECHR, in light of the conclusion which I have come to in relation to the common law, it's unnecessary to lengthen this judgment further by addressing the procedural requirements that might arise under Article 8. Suffice it to say, it could not give greater rights that the common law, than the common law would in a context such as this. And then these words, in view of the considerable difficulties which would lie in the way of an argument based on Article 8 in the light of the decision of this court in ZT, it would not be fruitful, in my view, to explore these issues in more detail. So we, we what's surprising about that is he says that in Citizens UK, but on the same day he hands down the judgment in AM, where you say he does determine that issue. Yes, I think in the context of specific, I think that the, the difference is, and you may feel it's a, it's a distinction without a difference. This that, is a generic case. Generic challenge, individual claimants challenge. And in the context of the individual claimants challenge, as Mother Justice Flo observes, he found Article 8 has no application, uh, but didn't feel it necessary to dispose of it as far as the generic challenge, other than observing that there will be considerable difficult, very considerable difficulties in the way of mounting a challenge. But he clearly had in mind, you say, that. It, it, uh, if, you, if he had gone further into the Article 8 issue, you, any, any um, applicant would run into the difficulty of yes. exceptional circumstances. Yes, we do. Well, you'll you be pleased to say that's, that finishes my survey of the authorities. Um, Lord, I, I've set out in my skeleton argument, I, you need to turn it up now, but for your note, uh, paragraphs 34 to 39, the propositions that I say emerge from those authorities. But we, we, we do say, just to reiterate, that the propositions that are made good are that Article 8 is only applicable 
in very exceptional circumstances, generally necessary for minors to institute the process of claiming asylum in the country in which they are, need to demonstrate no effective way of proceeding, um, cannot invoke Article 8 to bypass Dublin 3, um, and that those principles are specifically applicable to claimants like this claimant who was refused under the, under the expedited process. And finally, that when considering Article 8, in the context of the expedited process and in, in any individual case, it must be recognised that the children were under the jurisdiction of the French care system who have their own responsibilities. Well, can I now come to um, the relevant parts of the chronology? Um, well, can I just hand up? It's the same chronology that's in the bundle, but very helpfully between the parties, there's an agreed chronology as to the facts. I'm going to take you through the facts, I hope quickly, with reference to this document. And it's already... Is this the document you got yesterday? It's a document... No, the document yesterday was a procedural chronology. You've also got in the bundle um, a factual chronology. This is the same document. I've just stapled it separately so your lordships can have it out whilst I make my submission. You, you've already got it, but it's just really just for your lordship's convenience. Can we just, can we just tell what was the second of those points you summarised? Um, the second of the points was that generally necessary for minors to institute the process of claiming asylum in the country in which they are to find out and be able to show that the system is not working in their case. Thank you. And, and, and is, that, is that because without that there is no breach of Article 8? Sorry. Yeah, yes, I think it's, 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 it's part of that. Without that, there's no breach of Article 8. But also because, perhaps from an evidentiary point of view, if what the claimants are seeking to establish for the, to the satisfaction of the court is that the Dublin regulation is no use to me, it can't, it can't address my needs satisfactorily, it's very difficult in practice to see how that could be demonstrated. Unless you... Unless you've, gone, unless, you, unless you've sucked it and seen, so to speak, um, that, that I think is so. I think that's the perhaps, but I think perhaps for both of those reasons. So, what would you like us to, to um, get out of this? Well, I, I'm just going to. You've got the chronology. I'm just going to draw attention, if I may, to um, just a, the, the parts of the chronology that we place particular emphasis on in light of the in light of the um, uh, principles. So you'll see, if you flick through the chronology to December 2016, which is on the third page, so December 2016, claimant told that family reunion application rejected with no reason. So, that, so that's the decision under the expedited process. Yeah. And then on the um, 30th of December 2016, um, the uh, district court um, made a protection order in relation to FTH as an accompanied, uh, unaccompanied child. And FTH was entrusted to the care of youth and social services. This, this, this is the next entry, 30th of December 16. So December 16, decision communicated. 30th of December, care order made in favour of the French authorities. And then in early 2017, you will see that FTH is taken to a French government uh, office or court for interview and informs the French authorities he wants to live with his brother in the UK, is afraid of the Eritrean government, is at risk um, from them and unable to practice his religion. And can I just show your lordships just where, that's, this is either one of the two documents I just want to take your lordship to just so you can see that entry in context. If your lordship picks up the um, unagreed bundle, I know your lordship has taken bottom doesn't, doesn't have it, but it's the first unagreed bundle and um, if you turn to page 112 of that I don't see, I'm happy to do this but I just don't see what the point is I mean, is, the, is this description contested? It, it's not that it's contested it just goes, it goes a little bit further than that as you'll see from the documents which, which again are not, not in dispute I don't understand it and I'm going to say your lordship to what the claimant himself says about it the trouble is it's easier it's quicker to allow you to refer to it than to say really you don't see it so it's carried on I, I, <laughs> thank you, my lord. I, 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 I promise I won't take up too much of your lordship's time with these sorts of references. But if you go to page 112, please, you'll see that there's a document in the bundle which was before the tribunal, um, and it, it, it records what the claimant um, told um, the, the French authorities who by this stage had care of him. Uh, uh, and you'll see that he uh, says, page, one, one, page 112, what is your final destination in Europe? Uh, England, 
why have you chosen this country? Uh, pour aller chez mon frère to go and see my brother. And then uh, uh, over the page, page 113, where, which country, England. Uh, top of the page, and then you, you'll see that at the bottom of the page, um, do you um, do you wish to claim asylum in France? And the box is ticked no. And then the claimant gave some evidence about that. He gave a uh, he provided a witness statement, um, which your lordships will find um, at page twenty one of the same bundle, so page nineteen. And you'll see that uh, at para 21, he deals with what he told French uh, carers, the French care system. Um, so para 21, bottom of page 23, my solicitor told me that they'd obtained, again by a safe passage, a document completed when I was at the Children's Centre in La Havre, which has some details about me in my case. The document is not dated, but I note that it says I'd spoken to, last spoke to Jonas on the 3rd of January. Uh, at the time, I was speaking to Jonas every day, or at least most days. I think it must have been completed on or soon after the 3rd of January. My solicitors have asked me about some of the things written in my answers to the questions in the document. The document says that I had come to Europe due to politic a religion. This refers to my fear of the Eritrean government, as I explained above. I'm afraid of the Eritrean government due to my religion as a Pentecostal Christian. And I was unable to practice my religion. I was at risk because of the policy of the Eritrean government. I also feared being conscripted into the army after I turned 18. Two, I was asked whether I wished to claim asylum in France, to which I answered no. I wanted to join my brother Jonas in the UK, and I understood that if I claimed asylum in France, I would have to remain in France and have my case considered by the French government, whereas I understood that the process which the Home Office, uh, while I was in the Children's Centre, was how I could join my brother Jonas in the UK. As explained above, people had warned me repeatedly not to apply for asylum in France or have my fingerprints taken there, as this would mean I would not be allowed to join my brother in the UK. I was also asked whether I had claimed asylum in France or another European country. I understood this to be asking whether I had applied for asylum in France or Italy, which is the European country I arrived at. So that's just to put in context the undisputed evidence before the tribunal as to the fact that the claimant didn't claim asylum in France and his reasons um, for, for not uh, doing so. Um, now going back to the, the chronology... <coughs> Um, you will see that on the 8th of March, so this is, is, is seen by the French, uh, the French in early 2007, on the 8th of March, the Secretary of State sent the French authorities a spreadsheet. Um, this is a spreadsheet under what was known as the filtration process, uh, indicating that a take charge request could be progressed if contact details for FTH uh, were, was located. And the uh, tribunal made a finding, you'll see to that effect at para 6. You may also want to note in the margin there, para 34, because the tribunal made a finding that, 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 that for this particular claimant, the marking was made in green, indicating that this is someone who, if a formal Dublin F, um, take charge request was made, there was an opportunity potentially to progress it under that formal process. Um, you'll then um, see that on the 16th of April, the claimant leaves... Uh, the Kayomi in La Havre. The Kayomi is uh, the centre where he's cared for by the French authorities, believing that he wouldn't be transferred to the UK. Um, in August 2017, over the page, please, um, he um, uh, <coughs> receives um, legal advice from Ashurst solicitors on a pro bono basis. And then on the 22nd of December 2017, um, there's a, a pre-action protocol uh, letter sent and um, wherein the uh, claimants are seeking reunion. And uh, attached to the back of that chronology, my lords, you should have um, copies of that pre-action correspondence. Can I just draw, it's at the back of the chronology. just to draw attention just to what it was that the claimant solicitors were seeking in that pre-action correspondence. If you go to page nine, the back of page nine of the pre-action letter, um, halfway down the page on page nine of the pre-action letter, 
um, what's said is that in all the circumstances, the, the, the Secretary of State's refusal to admit FH in the expedited process and the decision to maintain that refusal is a disproportionate interference with his rights and those of his brother under Article 8 and breach of Dublin 3. In light of FH's extreme vulnerability and his tragic history, and the need to act in his best interest, there can be no question that he qualifies for admission under Dublin 3 and that Article 8 requires his urgent admission to the UK. As such, the Secretary of State's failure to transfer FH under the expedited process is unlawful and or in breach of Article 8. Um, for the avoidance of doubt, as held in the Kayemi case judgments, there is no answer on the facts of this case to suggest that FH's remedy to the unlawful decision in the expedited transfer process is to start again in the normal Dublin 3 process by claiming asylum in France. And then at the bottom of the page, alternatively, whilst he does not accept the need to meet any ZT threshold, FH does in fact meet the test. And then just details of the action the Secretary expected to take, please confirm by the 5th of January that in light of the contents of the letter and the enclosed documentation that arrangements will be made for FH to be transferred to the UK. So n n no question that in pre-action correspondence, what the claimant is seeking is access to the UK directly under Article 8 without the need to trigger Dublin 3 by claiming asylum. Um, there's then the next document just behind that. You'll see there's the Secretary of State's response to that pre-action letter. Um, in, in fairness, the response was criticised by the tribunal for not engaging sufficiently with the substantive uh, points made in the pre-action letter. But if you just look on the, the, the second page of the response, what the Secretary of State says is under little three, the last sentence of little three, Secondly, your client has an effective remedy in any event in that he can engage with the French authorities to register his asylum claim in France. So that was the Secretary of State's response. And that point, um, the, the availability of an alternative remedy, um, was a point that the Secretary of State continued to take throughout the judicial review proceedings, both for the purposes of the JR, in, in other words, in relation to the alternative remedy being an answer to a JR, and in relation to Article 8. That's a constant theme, but, but both of those submissions were rejected at um, all stages. Um, on the 16th of February of 2018, um, you'll see from the chronology that judicial review proceedings were issued. And I've already taken your lordships to the relevant paragraph parts of that JR uh, document. And again, it reiterates, as I showed your lordships, a request for direct access to the UK without the need to engage Dublin 3 by claiming asylum. What then happened is, um, if you look at the entry for the 19th to the 21st of March of 2018, um, there was uh, contact uh, with the French authorities, uh, inviting them to take charge under Dublin 3. So what happened is, instead of claiming asylum, the claimant solicitors wrote a letter to the French authorities inviting them to make a take charge request to, to the UK authorities, but without having to claim asylum. Um, so that you can see that, because it, it may be um, relevant um, later on. Again, can I just take up the unagreed bundle at, at page 133? This is a translation of a letter that you'll see on page 131. So 133 is an agreed translation of the letter that was written um, in March. And you'll, you'll see um, that uh, second paragraph, we understand you've made contact with Safe Passage, who's providing support whilst he remains in France. You've indicated that you wish to submit a take charge request under Dublin 3 arrangements to the UK in respect of him. You said that you would like to have copies <coughs> of the documents available to demonstrate his relationship with his brother. We attach those documents. And then if you just skip the next paragraph, our position uh, in, in that claim, so referring to um, the previous claims, that FH made an asylum claim when interviewed during the expedited process and asked if he wished, and asked if he wished to claim asylum in the UK. Just pausing there, um, you, you will note that in the Court of Appeal, in fact, found that the expedited process itself didn't amount to um, a procedure which involved making an asylum claim. Accordingly, 
We consider that any take charge request should be made under Article 8.1 of Dublin 3, as he was an unaccompanied minor when he first made his asylum claim and he wishes to join siblings in the UK. Article 7.2 requires determination of responsibility to be made on the basis of the situation at the time a claim for asylum was lodged. In the alternative, if you decide to make a take charge request under Article 17.2.3, as a result of um, passage of time, we consider you should refer to the extreme unfairness in the expedited process and the extensive delay it caused. Um, you'll note that it's not suggested in this letter that the claimant has ever made a, a claim for asylum in France, um, and it's implicit in the letter that he needn't do that. It's effectively what, the, what they're trying to achieve, for, for whatever reason, is that the French authorities make a take charge request without the necessity of the claimant having to make any kind of claim for asylum to the French authorities. Going back to the chronology, on the 22nd of March 2018, the um, French authorities um, acknowledged um, receipt, and um, there were then, um, when this document, the document I've just taken your lordship to, um, the correspondence by the claimant's solicitors to the French authorities, when that was disclosed, um, that resulted in the Secretary of State making inquiries with the French authorities to find out what they were doing about this correspondence. How, how, how were they responding to it? What was their position? And you will find that if you, if you go to page 279 of the bundle, um, and Page 279 is, um, this was a document that was in disclosure before the tribunal below, and it's an internal uh, document recording the, con the content of inquiries that had been made by the Secretary of State with the French authorities. And it says this, um, uh, Julia, I've contacted Severine Givere with the Prefecture de Pas de Calais. She immediately recognised the name of Fitzim Hailu. He's been staying at the CAS where he was advised that he needed to make an application for asylum in order to pursue his request to join his relative in the UK under Dublin 3. However, he declined to make an appointment in order to pursue, in order to, uh, and left the CAS on 16th of April. I and since. That. You read it. Yeah. But so that, that's that. And then page 273. Um, perhaps I'm going to invite you Lord, to read the bottom of that page. This correspondence with the French authorities. And then finally, 27. Okay, are you referring to the or simply to prove the negative? He never made an asylum claim in France, or what? Um, well, what's the relevance of all this? Even though even if it's admissible, which it said against you, it isn't, because the tribunal has made findings of fact. What, what's the purpose of showing us this, this underlying material? Um, well, it, it simply goes to the point um, that, well, as your lordship says, it, 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 it's the background to why the claimant didn't claim asylum. I mean, the witness state, the claimant's witness so statement. So what? Yeah. Well, he didn't claim asylum. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's common ground that he yeah. didn't claim asylum. Well, well can, 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 I, can I come to you what we say all of this shows? Because I, 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 I take the, the hint <laughs> that your that your lordship has seen enough um, of, of the uh, of this, and I'll. Come, come to what we say is the, 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 the nub of it. Um, on the facts, it is this. The, the, the defendant, um, the claimant, was notified of the decision um, along with others in December 2016. And the period uh, following that, in respect of which a declaration was made, is some 17 months. So it's the 1st of December 16 to the 27th of July 2018, when reunion was effected. And we say that one, the, the, the correct way to anal analyse that period is there are two distinct periods. Um, the first period is from the 30th of December 16 to the 16th of April 17, which is a period of four months. 30th of December 16, it's the date of decision, to the 16th of April 17, which is a period of four months. And during that period, the claimant was a minor uh, under the care of the French authorities. And in accordance with AM, that was a highly relevant factor to the application of Article 8, both because 
France bore primary responsibility for processing any asylum claim the claimant may wish to make in the context of Dublin 3, and because France itself was bound to ensure no breach of Article 8 ECHR. On the facts, what one gets from the documents I've shown you, I, I hope not completely irrelevantly, is that the, that the French authorities knew that the claimant was a minor, um, that he had a basis for an asylum claim, and that he had a brother in England who he wished to join. Uh, 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 and we also know that, that, the, the, that notwithstanding that, the claimant indicated to the French authorities that he did not wish to claim asylum in France. Well, the second period that I want to draw attention to is the 11th of August 17 to the, uh, to the, tw the 27th of July 2018, a period of 12 months, mm -hmm. at which point the claimant was an adult. He was over 18 years of age. Um, he had been in receipt of independent legal advice, so from Ashurst in August 2017 and Bat Murphy from at the latest December 2017. And the position adopted during that period by his legal representatives was that he should be um, granted access to the UK under Article 8 expressly without the need for him to claim asylum. Uh, and that is... is all highly relevant, we say, because of the principle on the authorities that Article 8 should not be used um, or invoked to bypass the Dublin regulation. Well, that's the nub of it on, on, the, um, on the facts. Look, can I deal with the way in which we say the tribunal... So that's just a, in a sense, that's, that's saying, isn't it, um, that... Um, as regards to that period, this case is indistinguishable from ZT. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, one, one um, might not say the same as regards to the previous period, no, um, but, 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 but then we have the point that he's under the care of the French authorities. Well, then you've got the AM. One. That's it. Um, well, in, in terms of the way um, in which the tribunal um, failed to apply those principles. We make um, three uh, points. If you just um, take out the core bundle and uh, turn up the uh, upper tribunal's decision, which you'll find behind tab eight of the core bundle. Which page? Uh, uh, well, page 78. We don't have tabs in the uh, Sorry, I'm so sorry, page 78. <laughs> There's been some discrimination. <laughs> I apologise for that. But, um, but, but page 78. Page 78. Uh, and uh, make the submission before drawing your attention to the, the relevant parts. The first point is that contrary to AM, a paragraph 88, so that's a, a, par, contrary to paragraph 88 of AM, we say that the tribunal incorrectly regarded Article 8 and, the, uh, um, and its procedural requirements as interchangeable with those of the common law. And where we get that from, in essence, is paragraphs 118 to 119, um, which is at uh, page 111. So you'll see that 118, 118 119, having set out the procedural failings Mr. Justice McCloskey's judgment is quoted, the relevant parts of it, and it says, applying this test and for the reasons given above in relation to our analysis of the applicant's right to common law procedural fairness, we find that the procedural aspects of, of his rights under Article 8 of the European Convention were also uh, breached. I'm sorry, I, I haven't got this. My fault, I'm sure. Pa paragraph what is paragraph, paragraph uh, 118 and 119, pages 111 and 112. And then, if you're looking, to... pres presumably, uh, the because because the hearing had taken place in May. Yes, it took place um, before. And so, um, I mean, as it happens, um, coincidentally, the judgment was, or well, the decision came out on the 12th of June, which was the same day as the first day of the Court of Appeal hearing in the city yes. of the UK and AM. But yeah. There's no reason for anybody to have notified the tribunal. 
Yeah. Well, well what, what, what in fact happened was, um, as your Lordship will know from procedural chronology, we, we did make an application to stay the claim behind yeah, it, yeah, yeah. And, and that was rejected. Um, obviously, we were, we were disappointed uh, with that result, but I don't seek to appeal it or to go behind it. But, but yeah. the, the fact is, that, uh, and I accept, that, that this judgment well, it's was... it's an explanation for, for their having followed... Well, it is. ...judgment from Mr Justice McCroskey. It, 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 it is. So it, it, it's entirely understandable that they fell into error in this way. I mean, you might say... It's, it, but but, but they, they plainly did. Um, we say... We also draw attention to paragraph 124... Um, we say, as a consequence, we find that the uh, manner uh, in which the expedited and the filtration process was applied to the applicant gave rise to uh, breaches of natural justice, common law, fairness, and also amounted to procedural unfairness for the purpose of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, and the applicant has wrongly been deprived of the opportunity to join YH since 30th November. So again, regarding the fact that you've got a procedural failure at common law, as interchangeable with the test for Article 8. Um, the, our second point on the judgment is that, again, entirely understandably... I'm, I'm sorry, just, just, yes. just to draw that, that point out a, a, a bit more. Um, I, mean, I, 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 I think I see why that's wrong, simply to equate procedural fairness under common law and procedural yes. unfairness uh, under human rights law. But what do, you, what do you say the error is there? Re re regarding... Well, it's the, it's the error that was identified by Lord Justice Singh at paragraph 18, uh, which was incorrectly regarding the standards of procedural fairness of common law as being interchangeable with what is required under Article 8. One, doesn't, one, simply, one cannot simply equate the existence of procedural failings at common law with a breach of Article 8, and that's, that's the finding at paragraph 88 by Lord Justice Singh. But, but you say standards of fairness... Um... And that, and, that, and that may be right as a separate point, but uh, it, isn't the um, focus of uh, a common law challenge and a human rights challenge completely different? The, com the common law looks at process, yes. uh, and, and that's what it did in this case. Yes. It found the process was bad, and hence the, the process was unlawful at common yes. law. But, but Article 8 doesn't look primarily at process. No. Well, it does. It does. It, it does have the reason it's a bit more complex. It, it, well, it looks primarily at whether there's a breach of substantive rights under Article Eight. That has a procedural aspect. I understand yes, that. Yes. But 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 the focus is on a, a breach of substantive rights. Yes. So you're you you you. It's it's not simply that the that the that the content of the um of, of the obligation to be fair may be different. May yes. be different. Um. Uh, but 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 it's a it's a different focus, isn't it? Well, it is, and that, that, that's why we say that Lord Justice Singh, with, with with respect, was plainly right to say one can't simply, as the tribunal did here, and Lord Justice and Mr. Justice McCloskey did say that because you've got procedural unfairness, which may be equivalent to procedural affair, um, a breach of the procedural requirements of Article Eight, that doesn't necessarily lead to a finding of a breach of Article Eight because the focus is different. Part of, part of the reason why that can't be right. Um, well, is there, I mean, that may be right. Is there authority on that point? Well, it's, it's AM, paragraph 88. It says it in terms that it's wrong to, it's wrong to, in paragraph 88 of AM, Lord Justice Singh says that the tribunal below fell into error by treating um, the um, uh, procedural requirements of the common law is interchangeable with those of Article 8 and finding a breach on that basis. That's the finding, and that's what we rely upon. Um, second, we say that the tribunal failed to ask itself, again entirely understandably, because of the timing of its decision, whether there were any very exceptional circumstances or any syst systemic deficiencies capable of justifying um, the um, claim for judicial review in the absence of a claim for asylum. Um, that language is nowhere to be found. Um, it was submitted that they should apply a very exceptional circumstances test apply, uh, following ZT, but, but that language is no part of their test. Third, what the tribunal did instead was to ask itself um, a very different question. It instead asked itself whether it was reasonable uh, for the claimant to believe um, that it was engage that he was engaging with Dublin Three by agreeing to be interviewed as part of Operation Pernia. 
And we see that in terms of the tribunal adopting that approach. One gets that from paragraph 122. Where it looks like where it is reasonable for the claim to believe that he was engaging with Dublin three. By, by taking part in the expedited process. Uh, and I'm where, not sure what point, what point is in dispute does that go to? Because if, we, if it's accepted, one thing to AM and, and CCG, yeah. okay, it's clear about, is that the extract procedure was not under Dublin 3. So what does that go? Where does this go? Well, it's just that that's the test that the tribunal applied. Um, we, we, it may be that you feel I don't need to go any further, but, 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 but what, I said the only question, the only really meaningful question in relation, in relation to the issue of whether on the issue of whether it, the appropriateness or, or the relevance of the fact that he didn't claim asylum. The only question the tribunal asked itself was, was it reasonable that the claimant didn't apply for asylum? That's the question it did address. And we say that that was asking whether it was reasonable for this particular claimant to claim asylum was not, it's not the same test, it's a different test and, it, and, and it's not, that doesn't give you the, the answer uh, under Article 8. So w w where, where I get that from, just to show you the reasoning adopted by the tribunal, because I'm anticipating points which um, may be made against me. Uh, if one, being fair, if one goes to page 122, so um, in, in our, so what, what, what the tribunal says, para 122, in our view, page 112, para 122, in our view, the applicant's involvement in the expedited infiltration process cannot be characterised as an attempt to bypass the totality of Dublin 3. When the Kelly camp was cleared, he was placed by the authorities in the CAP, temporary reception centre, somewhere between the 24th and the 26th of October. He was then transferred to a Kayomi in La Havre on the 27th. Once there, he was assessed as part of Operation Pernia Phase 2. And then they say, during this process, it was reasonable, for the reasons given above, for him to believe that he was being assessed for transfer to the UK under Dublin 3. So that's the reason they did adopt. And then that refer cross refers, just to, to be fair to the tribunal, to Paragraph 67. So Paragraph 67, page 98. As we stated above, it's not necessary for us to resolve any dispute as to whether the expedited process was part of the White Dublin 3 or separate from it. However, the applicant said in his statement, this is a statement I took your lordships to, dated the 5th of February, that when the Calais camp was demolished, he was told that unaccompanied minors with family members in the UK would be considered for transfer to the UK. It is our view that this was relevant to his subsequent actions after his claim for asylum was rejected and his failure at that point to make a formal application for asylum. In particular, the fact that even the respondents' officials regarded the expedited process as part of Dublin 2 until 8th of February 17 explains why the applicant did not make a formal application for asylum in France when he was interviewed at the CAO in some time in early January 17. So what they're saying is the claimant had a degree of their explanation for why, whilst he was a minor, that he didn't claim asylum, is that he was in a degree of confusion about what the different processes uh, meant. Um, the reason that, I mean, that, that, that is not uh, a basis in our submission on which it could properly be held that the ZT threshold was met for these reasons. Um, first, the ZT test is not concerned with a claimant's subjective reasons uh, for claiming, asyl not claiming asylum or not, nor even whether those beliefs are reasonably held. The true question is whether there are, are quote-unquote, objective reasons to justify a decision not to rely upon the expedited process. The claimant must demonstrate that the process was, objectively speaking, incapable of responding to his needs. Whatever... Uh, subjective confusion, whatever misapprehension the claimant may have been labouring under whilst he was a minor, it was, it was at all material times open to him, um, having not been selected for transfer under the expedited process, to um, claim asylum in, in France and, um, to, uh, and engage the Dublin process, as found by the court in CUK paragraph 50. Um, moreover, uh, whatever misapprehensions he may have had whilst he was a minor, um, once in solicitors were involved, as they were initially in summer 2017 on a pro bono basis, and then in December, formally with legal aid, um, he, he, he can't possibly have been labouring, or his representatives can't have been labouring under any misapprehension at that point. 
And that was, of course, well before the decision was made to institute proceedings in reliance on Article 8. Well, that brings me to, to, to the, the, what your Lordship, I think, puts me with really the nub of the case, which is whether the, uh, with a, perhaps a longer preamble than you expected, uh, uh, whether it was right to distinguish ZT or AM, whether there's a, a, a good basis to do so. If I deal with ZT first and then AM, um, in, in um, the, the tribunal held that the reasoning in ZT was wholly inapplicable. Um, and it, it, in essence, what the tribunal said um, is that unlike the claimants in ZT, um, it could not be said against FTH that he was seeking to bypass Dublin 3. Uh, he, says the tribunal, was somebody who had deliberately and actively engaged with the Dublin 3, what, what he thought was the Dublin 3 process. And for that, perhaps I won't waste time, I draw it, but, but, but you'll see that in, in the liability judgment, paras 121 to 123, and in the damages judgment at Paris 3 and 4. But there are three problems, we say, with that line of reasoning, that basis for distinction. The first is that all of the claimants in AM itself had sought to engage with the expedited process. That did not prevent the Court of Appeal from finding that the ZT principles were, uh, in the, were applicable to those types of claimants, um, or that those principles were um, uh, or that the threshold test was not met. Uh, second, it's not, uh, we say, an appropriate characterization of this case to say that the claimant was not seeking to bypass Dublin 3. He had sought to do that in the sense that he um, had not at any stage uh, claimed asylum prior to the hearing before the upper tribunal and had instead sought, through his solicitors, to gain entry relying on Article 8 and on the explicit basis that it was not necessary to claim asylum. And thirdly, e even assuming uh, that it could be said uh, that it's right to characterise the claimant as someone who had engaged or sought to engage with the Dublin 3 process, we dispute that, but assuming I'm wrong about that, that itself does not lower the threshold under ZT. Uh, uh, it is still necessary to demonstrate um, that, um, by reference to objective evidence, that the Dublin 3 system is not capable of responding adequately to the claimant's needs, for which proposition see RSN, para 142, the proposition that engagement doesn't lower the threshold. Um, that brings me to AM. And what is said about AM um, by, as I understand it, uh, by the respondents to this appeal is that what is particular about AM is that in that case, um, AM um, and the link cases, um, the claimants were seeking mandatory orders for the claimants to be returned to the UK. Whereas in this case, so it is said, the tribunal made no such order. And instead, it is said that the focus of the tribunal's decision in this case was a historic declaration in relation to Article 8. Um, we say that that reasoning is not sustainable for uh, four reasons. Um, first, there is no, in reality, no distinction with the relief that was sought in this case. As you have seen, the claimants were seeking, in their grounds of challenge, orders that the claimants be transferred forthwith to the UK under Article 8. And I've shown your Lordships the grounds where it makes that clear. Uh, second, as regards the, um, the relief that was obtained, the relief obtained did in fact include a specific declaration that the claimants, that the continuing failure to admit the claimant was unlawful under Article 8. That's what the declaration says. Um, by the date of the disposal hearing, it was unnecessary for the tribunal to go any further than that because the claimant had already, in fact, been transferred to the UK. The damages judgment, the disposal judgment, was October 2018, and the claimant had already been transferred by then on the 27th of July 2018. Um, but that feature of the chronology, that fact that it was unnecessary for them to make an order, um, it is not any satisfactory basis for distinguishing um, the 
uh, relief sort were obtained so in this relief, case. They said the relief they did get did include yes. uh, reference to a specific, uh, a specific declaration there was a continuing breach of Article 8 by the yes. failure to accept from the UK. Yes. yes. That was in the first judgment. In the first judgment. In the first judgment. And the, by the second judgment, it was unnecessary to go further and make the sort of mandatory order that, that was made by McCloskey J, because by then um, the claim had already, in fact, been admitted. But nothing we say can, a principle could possibly turn on that. Um, third, more generally, um, the test for whether there's been a breach of Article 8 um, cannot depend, we say, on the relief sought or obtained in consequence of the breach. Um, that is, we would say, rather the tail wagging the dog. Or, or putting the matter another way, um, the, the test for Article 8 cannot depend upon whether the court or the tribunal is looking at the issue prospectively or retrospectively. Um, whether there is an ongoing breach of Article 8 requiring a mandatory order or a retrospective breach requiring declaratory relief, the test for the breach of duty in respect of Article 8 must be the same. It's rather, we say, there's an analogy here with um, Hardy or Singh principles, unlawful detention cases of, of the sort with which this court will be familiar. Whether one is coming to the court saying the claimant needs to be released because his detention is unlawful, or one is saying retrospectively wants a declaration for a period of unlawful detention. The test is the test, it's the Hardy or Singh principles. One doesn't alter the test depending upon the nature of the relief uh, that's being sought. Or putting the matter yet another way, if there was no um, continuing or prospective obligation at the material time to ensure family reunion under Article 8, there can be no retrospective claim for breach of, that, of any such obligation. So however, I mean, one can put it in a number of different ways, but the suggestion we say that everything turns upon the relief, we say, um, cannot be right. I don't find that a self-evident proposition. I mean, if the claim is that, 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 you, that there was a breach of uh, rights in failing to give a fair hearing, a fair opportunity for the claimant to put their case, and that therefore what you want is you want a declaration that the decision that was made as a result, which is to refuse <coughs> entry, fails. That's, that's one thing. I don't see that it's necessarily exactly the same test to be applied and the same considerations to say you must now readmit, because the rights are different. In one case, you're asserting a right to be admitted and joined with your, with your family. The other you're saying, I want a fair hearing, that's all. Why, why do you say they're exactly analogous? We don't. We just say that the declaration that was in fact sought and granted in this case was not limited to a, a declaration that there was some procedural unfairness at one stage in the process. It was a declaration that there's an ongoing, an ongoing failure to admit the claimant under Article 8. We, we demand to be returned, was what the claimant said in pre-action letters. I and in, in, why I thought you should do it. Do it. Yeah. I thought you were why no. no, but, but in, respect, in respect of the declaration that was in fact sought and was in fact granted, right. namely a declaration that there's, an, we, we, we want an, a declaration that our on the ongoing failure to admit uh, is in breach of Article 8. The te we say in respect of that declaration, the test must be the same, whichever way one looks at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in any event, um, this is, I'm addressing an argument on distinction made by the respondents. The, the true basis on which the tribunal itself tried to distinguish AM is to be found at paragraph 5 of the damages judgment. So if you turn up uh, paragraph um, uh, page 121 of the core bundle, And yes, paragraph five. So at this stage, um, in the damages judgment, we already have the decision of the Court of Appeal in AM, and the, uh, the, 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 the tribunal is now trying to defend its decision that damages are still payable and, 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 and does so on the basis that AM is distinguishable. Um, at paragraph five, so Bosman 1 to 1 says, in paragraph 66 of AM, 
Singh LJ noted that the respondent relied upon the fact that the upper tribunal in giving judgment in that case had given no consideration to the fact that France bore primary responsibility for processing the children's claims in the context of the application of Dublin III, that France itself was bound to ensure no breach of Article 8 of the ECHR occurred. However, the evidence which was gradually disclosed over the course of the current claim indicated that it was the respondent and not the French authorities who taken the decisions which were primarily responsible for the applicant not being reunited with YH in a timely manner. In addition, the applicant was not under the jurisdiction of the French care system for much of the period in which damages are claimed. The applicant left the family in La Havre on the 16th of April and then became 18 on the 10th of um, uh, August. Um, in respect of that, we say that neither of those propositions is a strong basis on which to distinguish AM. Um, first, um, it, it's equally true in AM and all the link cases that the UK was primarily responsible and not the French authorities for the um, uh, for the failings which led to the claimant not being the claimants not being reunited. Indeed, you've seen that McCloskey J held that the five cases were beset with procedural deficiencies and shortcomings amounting to egregious unfairness by the Secretary of State. There was no finding at all by McCloskey J that the French authorities were in some way responsible for the decisions which uh, had the consequences they did. And none of that prevented um, the court uh, accepting Mr. Eady's submission um, that it remained important that once the claimants were, were under the jurisdiction of the care, French care system, um, that those um, carers were under a responsibility to process the claims in accordance with Dublin uh, and to ensure no breach of Article 8. Um, secondly, on the facts of this particular case, um, the, it, what can be said is that the, claim, the this care claimant, FTH, was the responsibility of the French authorities once the, the relevant decision under the expedited process had been made. Just to refresh your Lordship's uh, memory, the claimant was being looked after by social workers in a French Kaomi when he was interviewed under the expedited process in November 16, um, having been transferred there on the 2nd of November. Um, for your Lordship's note, you'll see, I'm not going to take time with this, but at page 124 of the bundle, you'll see a, a document which sets out the circumstances in which he was being looked after at that Kaomi, including the access to French social workers, etc., at the Kaomi. Um, the decision was communicated in December, at which point um, he was transferred formally into French care in December 16. So after about the same time, or immediately after, according to the agreed chronology, he was transferred formally into French care. And we say that um, his position, the position of this particular claimant was materially identical to those of the claimants in AM. Um, he was also in a position uh, where um, he was under the care of the French authorities. Um, the, the French authorities could have uh, taken steps to apply for asylum on his behalf. Um, your Lordships um, need to take time with it, but at paragraph 45 of ZT, it's referred to in the judgment as well, Para 45 ZT, there's reference to the procedures which are in place for, for French carers to make an asylum claim. The French were plainly aware that he wanted a claim, that he was in fear of being returned to his home country, that he had relatives in the UK, and he remained uh, under the care of the French authorities throughout the whole of the filtration process until leaving of his own volition in April 2017. So we say nothing could possibly, in this case, turn upon the dates to which the tribunal alluded. Um, well, that brings me to the final uh, point, and I, I, I uh, your lordships will no doubt stop me if you feel that it's not appropriate for me or necessary for me to address this, but I did make the point that had the, uh, the correct threshold task been, been addressed, um, in other words, the ZTAM test, um, the, the tribunal would or should not have concluded that it was met. Um, it was no part of the claimant's case below. Um, I'm uh, sorry, but I think the moment, it me, sorry, the moment it seems to me that is not a ground of appeal. No. It's not this, I, I should hesitate to talk to the way I, I, I put it. it it's that I, I assume that if your lordships were with me on my primary ground of appeal, your lordships may then want to go on to decide whether if the correct tests were met, um, it would lead to... No, no, we're not going to 
Yeah. Okay, well, was I, I won't... Uh, I would have thought so. Well, I would have had to hear yeah. what... Uh, what, what okay, well, 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 perhaps I'll reserve what I have to say about that to, to reply then. But, my Lord, um, th those are my primary know. submissions. But we, we do... We do can I finish by making just one overarching... I mean, he's here now. Yes. Yeah. What we're concerned about here is a point of principle. Yes. We're not concerned with, except as, as I see this appeal, the ground of appeal, we're not concerned with, on the facts uh, uh, if the uh, uh, tribunal was correct, nonetheless, did they properly apply the exceptionality test? That's not what we're concerned with here. We need to appeal to the on one ground, which is the ground of principle about the application of AM to these facts. And the, one of the reasons, it seems to me, that's subject to what other people may feel on the bench, but it seems to me at the moment, is one of the reasons why we shouldn't go into those other matters, uh, it, it, it seems to me, is because they're academic now. He's here. So there is, for the purpose of future, for the purpose of, a fu of future proceedings, which raise the same point, the point in the ground of appeal is a point of importance. But the other points, which are points of fact in a particular case, don't seem to me to raise a point which we should hear as what is now an academic question. Well, Lord, that, that's as it seems to me. Yeah, well, it, it, the, the point I would make is not academic in terms of the claimant's entitlement to damages. Uh, that's, that's the issue that this tribunal is, this, this court, I should say, is primarily determined. But, but, but given your Lordship's indication, I won't trouble your Lordships with, the, with, with it until perhaps it arises. Perhaps we'll see the way in which the issue of compensation isn't raised as a ground for appeal. Well, no, but it, it arises from the declaratory relief. It would, there would be no damages unless the declaratory relief... There can't be a claim for damages unless the declaratory relief is sustainable. But that, that's the way we put it. But perhaps given your... I won't trouble the court then with a... As you say, let's wait, wait till the reply. Let's I see know. what happens. Yeah, by all means. But can I finish just on, on this point, which is a, an, an overarching point? Is we, we do say that quite apart from the... the general position that your Lordship has raised, that, that, that this case does raise another... Um, point of principle on which this court may wish to um, consider giving guidance, uh, and that is, of course, the Secretary of State had obligations um, at common law in respect of the expedited process and its treatment of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children and vulnerable adults, and the Secretary of State has, of course, been found wanting in respect of that process and in respect of this process generally. We don't seek, of course, to go behind that. But we do say that those representing children in the sort of situation this claim we're in that do have their own obligations, a duty to ensure that their clients are properly advised of their rights under the Dublin regulation, and their need to claim asylum in order to trigger those rights at the earliest possible opportunity. So that goes to issues relevant to orderly immigration control. It goes to issues of appropriate use of this court's resources. But perhaps most importantly, it goes to the interests of individual children and vulnerable adults that appropriate remedies for obtaining reunion are deployed and exhausted at the earliest possible stage. And it is a matter... Uh, well, that seems to me to raise a point that's not raised by the ground of appeal. As my Lord point, pointed out to you, there is a single, very narrow ground of appeal. Yes. You have not sought to raise any other ground of appeal. No. No, 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 as no. to the process which was followed generally or as to the compensation which was awarded, or as to yeah. whether the tribunal would have, if it had applied the right test, would have reached the same result. No. But we do say... Oh, I, 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 no, I see your point. So I, I, think what you're, I think what you're saying is, if we were with you on your ground of appeal, yes. really uh, what that highlights is that where everything went wrong here, you say, is that acting on a mistaken assumption about what the claim of children's rights were. Yes. Yeah, that was right. And, 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 they, and, the process under Dublin Three was not triggered as soon as it should have been, and that you say we'd have to consider this, of course. But you say that one one lesson to be learned from this, if you're successful, is that um, uh, Dublin Three needs to be triggered in its proper way as soon as possible. Yeah, I, I don't mean to do be, beyond. Um, uh, my, my Lord, the ground of appeal, it's just that our ground of appeal is yeah. that it's necessary to engage the settlement <coughs> process at the earliest stage. That's, yeah, that's, 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 that is our ground of appeal. And, and, and we say that, 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 that part of the, the reason why that is such an important principle is for the reasons I've given. Um, uh, uh, and, and that's the only way in which I put it. It highlights, as, your, as my Lord puts it, those other factors. Lord, unless I can assist you, you your Lordship's any further, those are my... Well, very grateful to you. Thank you very much. Yes. My Lords, just before I begin, 
Um, may I check that you have the procedural chronology that we circulated yesterday to hand, because I will be referring to that. <coughs> Thank you. I, don't, I, 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 I haven't got that. Right. My Lords, uh, in my submission, the Secretary of State's appeal is an unprincipled and confused attempt to use the ratio of ZT Syria to prevent FTH, the applicant, from obtaining findings and remedies to which he would undoubtedly otherwise be entitled under the Human Rights Act in challenging the Secre Secretary of State's decision-making under a domestic decision-making process. That process, the expedited process, made decisions, and when I say made decisions, the Secretary of State's officials made decisions on whether or not children should be reunified with their relatives in the UK and transferred to the UK, and then implemented those decisions and it unquestionably, as my learned friend eventually conceded, engaged Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, so that unlawful decisions and unjustifiable interferences with that right must plainly attract appropriate remedies under the Human Rights Act and in domestic law. It is my submission that the ZT Syria judgment had a narrow focus and was aimed at a very particular set of facts and circumstances and remedies which do not arise in this case. And my Lords, just as an aside, I will take you to the uh, order which was made it by the tribunal in this case, which my learned friend did not show you in the course of his submissions. It's that order that is under appeal and nothing else. Now, in my submission, the radicalism of the Secretary of State's approach is illustrated by paragraph 50 of his skeleton, of my learned friend's skeleton argument. He says that there can be no reliance on Article 8 of the European Convention and no claim for damages because, quote, claimants must be in a position to establish that there are no satisfactory means of reunion through the French asylum system before they can rely upon Article 8 in the UK courts. That, in my respectful submission, cannot be right, and it is not what either ZT Syria or AM found. Insofar as ZT Syria uh, and the test that it um, set out has any bite in this context at all, it does so only where applicants are seeking by their claim a judicial review claim to obtain entry to the UK outside Dublin 3 or any other process established by the Secretary of State for applications for admission to the UK based directly on Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Now there was an order of admission to that effect outside the processes of both the expedited process and Dublin 3, which the Secretary of State appealed in AM. And I'm going to show you the relevant you parts of the judgment. Just, I'm just saying, not, I'm just saying, not, yes. Uh, could you just get back a little bit there? You said there was an admission. There was a, an order <coughs> to admit outside the processes of the expedited process and outside Dublin 3 in AM. That's the critical feature of AM, which is absent in this case. There was an order that the Secretary of State admit those children outside those two processes, based on Article 8 alone. And it is that order 
which the Secretary of State appealed in AM and others, and that order, which the Court of Appeal disapproved as not meeting the ZT Syria test. And those passages my learned friend took you to, paragraphs 66 uh, and 88 to 89 of AM. 66, 88 to 89. Of AM in the Court of Appeal. That is what was disapproved. But in my respectful submission, what the ZT Syria test cannot possibly act to prevent is reliance on Article 8 or the insertion of a high threshold test to claims under Article 8 where the challenge is not made outside the processes, but within them. In other words, it's a completely traditional judicial review claim brought to a decision taken by the Secretary of State on ordinary judicial review grounds, including, as is both permitted and required by the Human Rights Act, Article 8 of the European Convention. Still less in my submission, when the decision is established as unlawful at common law, on ordinary common law grounds, so that it must be quashed and retaken, and that is what happened in this case, and also in Citizens UK. And you can see that um, what the Court of Appeal said there was that that was the appropriate remedy for decisions that were taken in the expedited process that were unlawful at common law, quashing and retaking. Still less in those circumstances can the ZT Syria judgment be used to suggest that remedies which would otherwise have been available um, are only available if FTH can show systemic problems within the Dublin III process in France. There is in my submission no logical or legal basis for that suggestion. Why? when challenging a UK decision taken in a UK process where the misconduct is the misconduct of UK officials, should an applicant seek a remedy in France? That makes no sense at all. There are, there are a few strands there. Um, when you say... Um, Those submissions started on the premise that um, there is common law unlawfulness established. Well, it, there, it, it, no, not on that premise. That is one of the premises. So it starts on the basis that there is a UK decision taken in a decision-making process established by the Secretary of State for the Home Department. And the, the important aspect of that factual that undisputed fact is that in ZT Syria, the whole vice uh, or the whole problem that the, Secretary of, that the Secretary of State was challenging in that case was that there was no decision-making process established before those individuals sought admission to the UK. They had simply written to the Secretary of State and asked the Secretary of State to admit them based directly on Article 8 of the ECHR. Now, the critical distinction here, uh, my lord. Your, your submission started when a decision, when it is established, the decision um, at, at common law is unlawful, so it's quashed and retaken, yes. then ZC Syria can, uh, cannot be used X, Y, and Z. So it's based... Well, it was those... an a fortiori point. What I had said was still less when it's established as unlawful on common law grounds. Can you, can you take that approach? But yes... I, it's, it, when the decision is established as unlawful on common law grounds, then even less, it is even less possible for the Secretary of State to say, well, you can't rely in challenging that decision on Article 8, even though it's unlawful at common law. No, but, but I mean, that's, that's not what the Secretary of State is saying. The Secretary of State is saying, as I understand his submissions, uh, her, her submission, is uh, firstly, you look at the common law. 
and it's been found that this decision was unlawful because of procedural yes. irregularities. And the common law grants some relief, declaration. So all that's done and dusted. It's a completely separate process to see whether this is challengeable on Article 8 grounds. That's what Lord Justice Singh said. You, well, can't, you can't, you can't um, elide the two. Well, my Lord, may I, may I leave AM for the moment? Because my submission about AM uh, and the relatively uh, brief reasoning in AM is that it was simply trying to apply the test that was set out in ZT Syria. Um, and no, but ignoring AM as yes, a matter of principle. As a matter of principle, I don't accept that it is a completely different exercise uh, when you examine the lawfulness of a decision under Article 8. Of course, there is a different legal basis for it, but I don't accept it's a different exercise. And I'm going to be showing you case law of the um, European Court of Human Rights on procedural requirements under Article 8, which make it absolutely plain that although, of course, the ultimate focus of Article 8 is either to prevent interferences, um, uh, negative in interferences with uh, family reunion rights, or family rights with private law, private life rights, or to promote uh, positive obligations to facilitate those rights, there is also a procedural dimension to Article 8, which can arise even where the court does not find the substantive right to have been established. Um, so there are cases on loss of opportunity as well, and I will come to those. Uh, but just as an aside, on that observation in AM, that the standards, the common law um, standards of procedural fairness and Article 8 standards are not interchangeable, uh, in my submission, of course that is, that is correct, but what the Lord Justice Singh also said in CUK was that it was unlikely um, that they would exceed the common law standards or be different, but equally it's my submission that it's unlikely that they would be lesser than those common law standards. And when one looks at what the procedural standards of Article 8 are, what is absolutely plain beyond argument is that this expedited process wholly failed to meet them. Um, and so the question then arises, and that is the key question in this appeal, if that process engaged Article 8, failed to comply with Article 8 procedural standards, and would therefore otherwise have been unlawful, what is it about the ZT Syria test that says that individuals in the UK uh, sorry, sorry, individuals seeking to join family members in the UK under the expedited, challenging decisions under the expedited process are unable to rely on section 6 to 8 of the Human Rights Act and obtain remedies for that uh, unlawfulness in the UK decision making. Right, so uh, just have the deep instruction of that. So, um, you say that... Uh, you say that uh, ZT Syria is to be distinguished from the present case uh, because um, uh, prior to the application to this country and the Secretary of State's decision not to admit, there had been no process pursuant to either Dublin III or the expedited procedure. They weren't engaged at all. So it was a kind of a standalone outside all of those things. That's one point you're making, I think. Yes. And then, uh, um, well, I, I understand that. I think you're going to say that's true of AM, but I, uh, let's get to AM later on. But that's certainly true of saying it's empty Syria. Mm -hmm. um, I, the other point, I think, but, uh, but my understanding is that, again, in, in, I, 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 I'm not sure you really sort of pinned your, 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 your colours to the mast on this one. I think you're saying in ZT Syria, what was it in, in issue was effectively an application to admit them to the country. That's what they were seeking. Yes. Whereas I think that you're saying, I you haven't quite articulated this, I think what you're saying here is that, that uh, in the present case, uh, um, there is no, nothing in ZT Syria which would indicate that what you can't get is a declaration that the... Um, 
uh, procedural safeguards in Article 8 have not been met. It's in a, a domestic decision-making process. In a domestic decision-making process. I think you're making that distinction, which is, a, we've had to come back to this, it's a distinction about the remedies here, I think. Mm. Well, it's a... It's because a, you, did, you did go on to say yes. that there's no reason why you can't get a Article 8 relief, even though, I think the way you put it was, you may not be able to get a more substantive relief. That they're not, you don't have to have one and the other. Well, perhaps if I may be allowed to develop um, these introductory points, it will become clearer. Yeah. But th there is a distinction, and uh, it's an important distinction, between what the individuals in question in ZT Syria were seeking to achieve and why that therefore gave rise to the development of that threshold test and what is what the individual in this appeal um, was seeking to achieve. They are very different. Uh, the factual matrix could not be more different because in one situation there was no domestic decision-making process and in another, in the other, in FTH's case, there was. There was a process established by the Secretary of State, designed by her, implemented by her, and she had obligations when taking those decisions to comply with Article 8 of the ECHR along with all the other rights in the Convention. So your, your point there is that in ZT um, they weren't following any, any process, whether it's Dublin or expedited process, any other domestic process that was, was um, set up. They just, as it were, sprang out of the blue and said, let us into the country. That's right. So the only decision is the decision not to let them into the country. That's right. So you, so you say, contrast here, where there's an entire expedited process, and as the tribunal has found, it's the procedural unfairnesses in that process, which you say attract um, Article 8, as well as giving rise to common law remedies. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, and what I, I also... Not, I, well, you'll come on to it. I, yes. I don't want to take you out of turn. I understand all of that in relation to ZT, uh, more difficulty in relation to um, AM. I will come on to where I say AM fits in that twin matrix, because I, yeah. I recognise, of course, um, that there are that, that, that FTH was a, uh, a child who had been through the expedited process like the children in AM and others. And so um, that factual distinction is not there, but I will explain what I say is going on in AM. Um, but what, what's, what, what is also important to understand about that decision-making process, and it's the reason why the confusion arises in my learned friend submissions with respect, is that, of course, the decision-making process was about family reunion. It was about bringing children to the UK. So if, as happened in FTH, that decision were quashed, then in the ordinary way, that would give rise to uh, the requirement for a new decision and to a, an ongoing breach, and we'll come to the terms of the tribunal's action, uh, relief, an ongoing breach from the time that the lawful decision should have been taken to the time when it was actually taken. Yes, but that, that breach might just be a breach not to consider the question properly, yes. not a breach of failing to admit. Well, I'm going to come to the terms are not of the, the order. Same thing. No, well, I'm going to come to ter the terms of the order because, very importantly, there was no order to admit. There was simply a declaration of a breach of the breach of various duties, including the common law duty, and it's the same declaration. Um, and it might be worth, since your logic has raised, it's in the chronology. There were, the, the terms of the declaration are set out in the chronology with references. The procedural, so, the procedural chronology. Right. Uh, there was a declaration. Where, where are we? And that declaration was made um, on the 12th of June. So you'll see it at page 5. Okay. And it's highlighted. It's item 3. Is it? It's item 3. 
a declaration that those decisions and the Secretary of State's refu continuing refusal to admit FTH were and are unlawful, being in breach of natural justice, the common law, and the procedural dimensions of Article 8. Now, I highlight here that there is no challenge to the first two parts of that declaration. Is, is that right? I mean, I thought the point that was being made was that the declaration here that uh, what was unlawful was the Secretary of State's continuing refusal to admit is just a different way of putting that he or she at that time was under an obligation to admit. No, and in, in my respectful submission, when we look at the judgment, you'll see that that's not the conclusion that one can draw from that. What the, what the court concluded was that the, re the continuing refusal to admit was based on breaches of natural justice, breaches of common law standards of procedural fairness, and the procedural dimensions of Article 8. So it, it's effectively, uh, um, or the, the overall question is an anterior one, I mean, that, that's your point, is it? Yes, this is a... It's all to do with what, they, what, they, what the Secretary of State should have been doing but wasn't doing. Yes. Before you get to the point where the decision is actually made. And then a it's decision... Not, it's not yes. attacking the decision that is actually made, because as we know, the decision that's actually made, eventually, is a decision to admit. What's it attacking? What it's attacking is the... Uh, the past misconduct. The past misconduct. It's th this whole claim, by the time it got to the hearing in front of the tribunal, was about the past misconduct of the Secretary of State. Yes, but the past misconduct said to be the refusal to admit. I, mean, I find this is, this is dancing on the pin of, well, the, the head of a pin. But the, it, it, but the past misconduct you're talking about, surely, is, is the procedural defect. Yes. yes. The, the refusal to admit was tainted by procedural defects. The refusal to admit is the proper characterization uh, of the decision that was taken in the expedited process, because that was all about admission. So the, there was a decision taken in the expedited process as to whether to admit a child or not, based on the criteria set up in the expedited process. And that refusal to admit was tainted by procedural unfairness, both at common law and under Article 8. But leaving Article 8 aside for a moment, common law, that's absolutely classic, traditional yes. public law stuff. Uh, the procedure's bad, uh, yes. and therefore the decision is unlawful, yes. and you set it aside. Yes. Fine. And make a declaration. And, make that a declaration which is all, all and that, that part of the, that's why I say the part of the declaration, which is in exactly the same terms both un, in relation to common law and Article 8, is not under challenge in this appeal. No, because the common law looks at procedure. And uh, that's why it's unlawful. You set it aside, start again. Uh, yes. But, but, but under Article 8, the position is very different. I, I think you're going to explain. Why it's the same, but um, it, well, it has it has Article Eight is a, has a broader context. So I, I I don't say that Article Eight is exactly the same as common law because it's because of course the judicial review standards are are not exactly the same as the standards of review under Article Eight. But they include the duty to provide procedural fairness in any decisions that uh, touch on the rights uh, protected by Article Eight. And that is why there was a breach of those standards here too. Now, I will also come um, after the, uh, the adjournment to what was sought in the original claim. Because in the original claim, of course, there had not at that stage been the developments. Of, there, were, there were a lot of developments. One of the reasons we produced this procedural chronology is that this was a very fast-moving situation. And there were a lot of developments both in the case law uh, and in the facts of FTH's case. And one of those developments was that the Secretary of State, as part of her attempt to stay the claim, um, made a last-minute settlement offer um, uh, of uh, a, 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 an acceptance of, the, of a take charge request if one was made by the Secretary of State. Now, that, that came in the middle of the hearing, and it was too late for it to be properly taken into account. But the fact was that that meant um, that the, uh, the need for a new decision, a new lawful decision, which was one of the remedies that was originally sought, uh, was no longer there. Um, and so that part of the um, remedies sought was not granted by the tribunal. 
they simply uh, considered the past misconduct, which was ongoing up until the point of the hearing, because the child was not um, uh, transferred until after, uh, and the decision was not taken until after the hearing. So, in my respectful submission, what the tribunal actually did is unassailable and not covered by the uh, ratio of ZT Syria. Uh, and unless you want me to, to continue, I can, I can, um, we do have a couple more minutes, so perhaps I can um, explain how I'm going to approach my submissions and then come back to them after the journal. So I'm going to uh, follow the, approach my submissions in the following order. First, I'm going to look at what the tribunal actually decided in this case and what is ordered, and we've, we've had, um, uh, we've started to look at that. Uh, and in my submission, that is what this appeal that is about, not what it was asked to order or might have ordered, but what it did order. Uh, I'm then going to look at the case law on procedural requirements under Article 8 and what Article 8 actually requires. I'm then going to look at um, CK and ZT Syria, what those uh, decisions decided and their, their scope. And there are passages of CK and ZT Syria that my learned friend didn't take you to that are relevant. Fourthly, I'm going to look at the scope of the Article 8 findings in Citizens UK and AM and others. And then finally, I'll draw together, draw together my submissions as to why in FTH's um, respectful submission, the appeal should fail. Very good. Thank you very much. All right. Start again.